Um, it, for, for those that have been in the class before, the way I normally do this is a PowerPoint, and normally when we do the scriptures, we ask somebody to read them out loud. It's good to hear God's word in addition to read God's word, and that's what we'll do. I want to give you just a little background on, on how this study came about and, and what we're going to try to accomplish here. Um, here's our plan. Uh, from our, our last class, I asked the regulars if they would submit to me uh, a couple, three of their favorite verses, and they've done that. And I took all of those verses, and then I went to Google, and I said, give me some really popular verses, and gathered those up. And I had about 60 or 70 verses in total, and then I started cutting them into uh, categories, kind of a related themes. Um, and I ended up with six themes. And, it, it, and the way things work out sometimes when, when uh, God wants to speak to us, things lined up that really, I think, will hit where we are in our world today uh, with the, uh, the frustration of people, the injustice of people, uh, the weariness of people with this COVID thing, the fear of the, of the virus and what's going to happen. Uh, and all of those kinds of things, just the verses, the way they fell, just kind of hit those themes. Uh, and over the next six weeks, we're going to do those. Each week, we'll hit a theme. We'll take a select group of the verses, and we'll see how God's going to speak to us in that. I, I sent you six verses this week, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do each week is just a six or seven um, to give you time uh, just to kind of digest them. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, if, if you had submitted one of these verses, I'm going to ask you to just tell me why or share with the group why. What was it about that verse that spoke to you or continues to speak to you? A lot of these verses are, are, are life verses for people. They come back to them over and over again. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you to tell your backstory. What is it about this verse or what happened in your life where this verse and God said, yeah, you need to understand this. You need to grab a hold of this. This is something important. Uh, and I think when we share that together, I think we're all going to be blessed by that. And so that's one of the goals of this class. And then finally, we're going to take one or two of the verses, depending on the week, uh, and then look at it in its biblical context and see if in context, does it give us an enhanced meaning, something new, something fresh. Uh, and that's sort of what the goal of what we're going to do here. Okay. So I'm going to do really quickly, we're just going to read the six verses out loud to start with. And Cindy, do you mind starting the first one? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Great verse. Uh, and then, uh, Patty, would you read this one? Do not be conformed to this world, but be... Joey, that's how... Can you move that? Sorry. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the re renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Romans 12. Great. And then Abigail? But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Thank you. And then Lori, the fifth one. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then the final one. Nancy, would you mind? Uh, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And then the, the actual final one, <laughs> I lost my place. Uh, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So those are the six verses. Uh, as you read through them, what, what was the underlying theme that, that kind of came to you? That was one of the questions I asked you to kind of say, to, to, to read them and say, how is God using these verses to speak to me right now? What, what, what did you come up with? Transforming, <clears throat> transforming ourselves to be more Christ-like. Okay. How would you define transforming? Um, it's a gradual change. 
Um, it's not just an instant snap your fingers. Okay. Okay. Someone else. I kind of took the, um, I, I saw like the renewing of ourselves. It's kind of the same as transformation, but maybe a little bit more specific. Yeah. Yeah. Hand in hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were any of these verses uh, one that was submitted? I know one of them was John Bruders and he, he's not here. I will tell you mine because I had the other one that was submitted <laughs> in this group. Uh, the New Living Translation is, but you, Timothy, are a man of God and flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And for me, this is one of those verses that I keep coming back to because it's personally addressed to me. Right. Um, so not all of you have that. I, I don't think there's a book of Nancy. Otherwise, Nancy would have one like this. But, <laughs> but for me, there... What, one of the things that I struggle with personally is discouragement. And I, and I get discouraged and I beat myself up and I don't want to do the next thing because I don't, I just, you know, I feel defeated a lot. That's one of the things that God continuously has to work on me for. And this is the verse that, that comes back for me. To forget about this and you pursue this. You make the effort. You be intentional. Uh, you pursue righteousness and godliness and faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And for me, that's always an uplifting thing. Uh, it's not a beat me down thing, but it's really uplifting that I have a choice in the matter and I can make this choice to pursue. So um, that's the, that's the backstory for me for this particular verse. Or any of these others, maybe you didn't submit it, but maybe they speak to you in a similar type way. Um, well, I enjoy uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, because I do need to be reminded that I am a new creation, mm -hmm. and that the old has passed. Sometimes it's easy for us to focus on the past, yeah. and um, I remember once I... I had a, a dream and in that dream I was driving and I was tr checking the rear view mirror as I was driving and the word came that there's no way I'm going to be able to advance forward if what I'm doing is focusing on the rear view, what's in the rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy second Corinthians five. And I know there's a typo error there. It should be 17. <laughs> we are a new creation. Huh? All right. Well, you pass the test and you get to go the car. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank the Lord that the new has come and the old yeah. is behind us. Right. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Thank you. All right, so that is, that is the theme here, um, is renewal. Uh, and, and I think what we're going to discover, or what I hope we discover tonight, is, is we need to constantly, continually, intentionally seek renewal. Uh, otherwise, we interrupt, we get complacent, we get tired, we feel like we've done enough. Unless we renew, and with the energy that renewal brings, um, we, we can't really move forward. We can't transform, as Abigail said, uh, the way we're asked to. All right. So there's this idea of coming clean, starting fresh. We talked about that. How important is this for you, this theme in your life? How, how important is renewal in your life? Or is it something you thought about? I think it's something that you just have, I mean, every day I just think about the changes that I personally have gone through, and I've just got to hope that I have the opportunity for renewal. I mean, because if I, you know, I guess like Donna said, if I continue to think about my past, I have no chance, 
you know, I need God working within me and the Holy Spirit working within me to renew me. I mean, we mess up every day. And if I don't have him picking me up and restoring me, no, I have no, I have no chance. So, I mean, that's, that's our hope, right? right? Our hope is that we're renewed. So salvation is not a one and done? I hope not. <laughs> So what, I, what I've done for the, for the back study that we're going to go over, we're going to start in Luke 3, and then we're going to head back to Isaiah 40. One of the verses was from Isaiah 40. Um, when I went to Young Life Camp a long time ago, this was a real popular one on shirts. It has a real high-sounding um, theme, you know, rides with wings of eagles. It, it, it's a very uplifting kind of thing. And it really ties into this idea of renewal. And so that's why I wanted to kind of uh, bring that in. So let's start in Luke 3. And I want to read this one because of all the names. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Uh, Andy Stanley starts a sermon with this, um, and he says, you know, Luke is saying, you know, test me with the facts. Understand the, uh, you know, that I'm, test what I'm writing in terms of history. And I think there's something else here. <laughs> it's that he's, it's not really about the history. It's, God spoke to John at a specific time for a specific purpose, um, and, and this is when this occurred. Now, I, I, I italicized in the wilderness with this question. Why is John in the wilderness? Anybody answer that question off the top of their head? What was the question, Tim? I'm sorry. Why was John in the wilderness? The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Why was he in the wilderness? That's where he lived. Yeah, he was. Go ahead, Nancy. Lori, you're, you're muted. But go ahead, Nancy. Oh, no, I was just say that's why I thought he was like, wore animal skin and ate honey and kind of lived out in the wilderness. Yeah, didn't he go there? He went to go get closer to God and to spend more time with God in, in prayer and was searching because he was isolated from everyone right. right let's go back let's go back a chapter so the angel said to him and now this is this is the angel speaking to his father zachariah your prayer has been heard your wife elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him john and he will be a joy and a delight to you for he will be great in the sight of the lord he will be filled with the holy spirit even before he's born and he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. So John was born with a purpose. John was born with a uh, being spirit-filled from the beginning. And if you think about other people that have been specifically called by God, don't they also spend time in the wilderness? Think of Moses. Moses was called. He's going he's to save the people. He messes up. He goes out in the wilderness for 40 years before God calls him back. What about Joseph that we just studied? Joseph wasn't in the promised land. He was sold to Egypt, into the desert of Egypt. You know, he was, he was there. But God prepared him for the mission that he had. Can you think of some others that have the same experience? It, Jacob wrestled with God in the desert. Okay. Did Noah and his family live separate? from the peoples of their time? I didn't hear the name. Noah. Noah. I don't know that. Once, once the boat landed, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. David, what did David do? He ran around in the desert until it was his time to ascend the throne. So there's something about being in the wilderness that uh, someone mentioned sort of prepares you for that. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself 
went out to the desert before he began his ministry. So there is this preparation period, and that's that's where that's why John's out there. Uh, I said that. Um, I forgot where I left off. Um, someone just volunteer here. He went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it was written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. All right, that's how we're going to get back to Isaiah. But the, repentance, this word, comes from the Greek word meta, to know it. I, I don't speak Greek, but that's the word it came from. Um, and what it means is a transformative change of heart. So it's, it's um, and John MacArthur, I'm sure you all have heard of, says, while we often relate heart to the emotions, he's got a broken heart, the Greeks relate it primarily to the intellect and to the will. So when they say you take it to heart, it means you take it here and you take it in your will, your actions, you're intentional about that. And so this baptism of repentance, it is a turn, it is a change, it is a change of heart, but it's really a change of mind as well, a change of will, a change of intention. And that's the baptism that he's, that he's, uh, that he's referring to. We'll come, back to, we'll come back to that here in a second. So this is the, this is the quote from Isaiah. Uh, and uh, I don't know where I am. Lord, you might read. read. Yeah, I'll read. A voice, of, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked way shall be made straight and the rough way smooth. And all humanity will see God's salvation. Will all humanity have God's salvation. If they accept Jesus, they will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There has to be this change. There has to be this repentance. There has to be this intentionality. Um, that's what John's calling us to do is to be intentional about this. Uh, you will see it happen, but unless you're intentional about it, it won't happen. Uh, I'll just put this because if you love Handel's Messiah like I do, you want to sing as soon as you hear this first. Uh, Cindy, would you mind? Then, then John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit, then, in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe lies ready at the root of the tree, trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What do you think of that preaching? It's pretty definitive. I mean, produce fruit. Right. There is a call to have an outcome. What about the highlighted part of it? If you were a Jew in that first century and hearing this, where did you think you stood with God? You were one of his chosen ones. Yeah. In the covenant. Well, yeah. 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 Part of the covenant. What do you have to do? Nothing. Nothing. You're part of the covenant. Abraham's our father. John said, no, no, no. This is an intentional choice, an intentional repentance. This is a decision that's made, a, a will, change your heart, your turn. Um, <clears throat> and you have expectations here. Um, one is to produce fruit, another is to change, so to actually do something. Three people question him, and we're going to go through those three questions really quick. Three people said, okay, John, you've preached this. Now what? And uh, Nancy, if you would, please. <clears throat> the crowds asked him, what, your, uh, what then shall we do? John replied, whoever has two tunics should share with him who has none, and whoever has food should do the same. So this is sort of 
the proper response that John has for them. When we repent, when we have that change of heart, we should produce a change of behavior. <laughs> What's the change of behavior here? Well, looking out for your fellow man. Yeah. Yeah. Not be less me focused. Mm -hmm. And then the change of behavior should produce fruit. And here, for this group that's asking him, it's show mercy. You're blessed. Someone else is not blessed. Bless them. Show mercy to them. Then he gets another, then he gets another question. Um, and uh, Donna, would you mind reading this one, please? Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Collect no more than you are authorized, he answered. Even tax collectors can repent? Even the worst are called to respond. And what are they called to do? To live justly. Don't, don't do more than you should. Be, be just about what you're about. And then again, there's a third group. Um, and then Bob, would you mind reading this one? And some soldiers ask him, and what should we do? Do not take money by force or fall accusation, he said. Be content with your, I can't read the last word, it's blocked. Widget. Yeah. Yeah, so soldiers would, would basically, um, the soldiers would uh, basically hit somebody up. I have the power, I can force you to, to give me money. I can extort money from you. And in his response, even Gentiles can, re can respond. Be humble, no more than you ought. That's the message. Is this a new message that John's preaching? No, oh, it's out of Micah. Bless you. <laughs> Micah 6, <eight>. yes. <laughs> yeah, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. John's not giving any kind of a new message but he is renewing for Israel where they, have, um, where they have stopped being God's people. They're relying on being Abraham's son and not continually, intentionally renewing their relationship, renewing their acts, and renewing uh, the fruit uh, that they're called to produce. So these are the three things that John preaches. Repent, change your mind. Willfully, intentionally, seek a better way, change your behavior. And the expectation, as John preaches, is that fruit is, will be produced. What fruit do you suppose gets produced when we change our mind and seek that better way? We bring people to the Lord. That's one thing that's produced. Righteousness. Right. We, there's a whole list of them. The fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Luke takes us back to Isaiah that John's that voice in the wilderness. And we're going to read parts of Isaiah 40. Now, the way I tried to take, take this together is John is speaking to the nation of Israel. And he he's points out that you can't rely on the fact that you're the chosen people. There's an intentionality that, that you need to be about. There is this renewing that you continually need to do. And we go back to Isaiah 40, and we'll put that in its context, and we'll see why this voice is not just applicable for Israel, but it's applicable for us as well. Um, and uh, Cindy, do you mind? Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim her, to her that her forced labor has been completed. Her inequity has been pardoned, for she has received from the hand of the Lord 
double for all her sins. What do you make of this? It can be anyone, it doesn't have to be me. <laughs> Perhaps the time of judgment is over. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were in that time of judgment, how would you view God? How would you view yourself? Well, her sins are forgiven. So she would be, you would be joyful that your sins are forgiven. And that your time of time, the hard times are over. Yeah, it's a message of hope here. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, is God just going to make it right? Eventually. <laughs> He's not just going to make it right. He's, He's going to make it double. Yeah. He's going to make it better. Yeah. Yeah, you go back to Job on that one. Yeah. So why is Israel being comforted? And someone mentioned it because they are in judgment right now. They are. They know they're not walking with God. They know they're not um, where they should be, even though they're chosen. Even though they're children of Abraham, they're they're going through rough times. They're going through hard times, and God says, "I, I know you are." But comfort, comfort. And one of the things that struck me about this is, is that did, did the highlights here, forced labor and pardoned. There, there's an enslavement because they're carried off. They're, they're in exile. They're, they're enslaved. They're forced. They're pardoned. But John says, no, no, no. We're going to get out of that, and we're going to have true freedom. All right, a little bit further on. Um, Abigail, do you mind? A voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So why is this, which Luke quoted, why is this in Isaiah 40? Comfort, comfort my, my people. I know you're under judgment. I know you're having a hard time, but I'm going to make it right. And why is this verse here now? Well, the Israelites were in Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were not in their homes. And so he was saying, even though you're not there, prepare your hearts for God. My footnotes say that, uh, oh, sorry. You're fine. Oh. Uh, my footnotes say that God is pictured as returning to Jerusalem. So, um, yeah, they're, probably they're, a welcome relief. Right. It's it, it, again. It's it, it, it's a herald for this is going to come to end. This this bondage that you've been under, this slavery that you're in, this um, can't think of the word, the captivity that you're in, that's coming to an end, and it's a, it's a hopeful message. Um, All right, next, um, Lori, do you mind? No. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Raise your voice loudly, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. John's directive to call this out to call prepare the way you know the kingdom of heaven is at hand um, your condition will change the the state of the nation is going to change is this our directive as well yep yeah my um, my concordance says the third voice 
is the news that God is leading his people back to Judah. The Lord is returning to Jerusalem, returning to his people. They return, they apply to the words, to the return of the exile, the first, and also to the first coming of Christ, the good news, the salvation that's coming to the people with the second coming of Christ. What holds us back from being that voice, that herald? Well, the verse says, do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. So sometimes fear. Power, money, and position. All of those. Right. Fear, fear of losing any one of those or... Yeah. Well, let's read on. Um, Joe, do you mind reading this one? Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm establishes his rule. His reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads the nursing ewes. One of the things that Sally raised is one of the reasons we're not the herald is because of the fear that we have. How does God answer that? He meets us there. When he, asks, when he calls us to do something and we do it, he meets us there. Yeah. He gives us the strength. He gives us the ability so that we can act uh, not on our own strength, but on his. Yeah. So as long as we're working for him and following <laughs> his instructions, we don't, um, we might still be afraid, but comforted knowing that we're not alone. Yeah, it says that he's strong, but also he's very gentle. Yeah. Gathering it to it in his arms and carrying them close to his heart. You know, that's an image of a, a baby, holding a baby close to you and taking care of it. Yeah, when your child's afraid, what do you do? You comfort it by hugging it, cuddling it. You fearlessly open the closet door and, and see that the monster is not there. Mm -hmm. And then you cradle your child. You, you hold him. So he, ta he takes care of our fear both ways. You know, be, be the herald. Be, be the announcer. Be, be the one who, who, who calls people um, to God. And yeah, that's, that can be scary, but we don't do that alone. Um, he comes, as, as Sean says, he comes with us. And, and he comes with his might, but he also comes with his tenderness. Uh, and just like a, a baby that you would, you would um, cradle, it's the same way. All righty, uh, Abigail, if you would, please. Why do you say, O Jacob, and why do you assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? and my claim is ignored by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yeah. Why would Jacob and Israel say that statement in context here? Because they're crying out for release. Yeah. And he hasn't responded in their timeline. Yeah. 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 Do they feel abandoned maybe? Yep. Yeah. We're the sons of Abraham. Why are we in Babylon? Mm -hmm. and why are you ignoring that claim? Why are you not fulfilling your promise? Well, you see, like, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I was just going to say, as usual, they were blaming God and not looking at themselves <laughs> and what they had done. Right. Or what they could do. He gave them plenty of forewarning. Yeah. Plenty. Call, call them to repent long before this. Yes. 
Yeah. Do you see you in any of these in, in these verses, in verse twenty seven? Maybe maybe at one time in your life, or sometimes in your life, maybe a season of your life. Do you see you in those verses? Sure. Yeah. Well, I said they often say God answers at eleven fifty nine, so <laughs> we always think He's not going to do it. Takes the he clips the red wire of the bomb when, when it's one second left on the yeah. uh, ticker. And That's when it's hopeful that our you know we have a history with God that that even though we felt like we were being ignored, that we can look back and see that maybe what we thought was best, God thought differently. And as we look back, we see that he showed up. Yeah. One of the things I love about reading the Old Testament, because I can kind of live through the nation of Israel, because they do the same dumb things I do. <laughs> over and, and over and over. Yeah, and you see God's <laughs> faithfulness, and you see God's wanting to restore them all the time, and promising to restore them all the time. And there are periods of wait, and there's periods of dryness, and there's periods of frustration, but God always comes back in the end. He always comes back and fulfills what he said. Um, and what I'm trying to do here is draw this out to us personally. When we feel we're not heard, when, when do we feel we're not heard? I think when we're focusing on ourselves and woe is me, rather than focusing on God. Yes. And his faithfulness and his greatness. Mm -hmm. How about when you've prayed for it and you've really prayed hard for it and, and continually for something? It's all in God's time, is in his time, not ours. Yeah. Is it easy to get discouraged when we don't have our prayers answered? Yeah. Oh, yes. How about this one? How about when we can grow dismayed that justice is far off or pain's upon us? It's not fair. I've been doing everything right. Why did this happen to me? Right. Um, you know, I, I don't deserve this diagnosis. I've been doing everything right. I've been trying to, you know, live by the golden rule. You know, on and on you can go with that. Yeah. Or I, I see this injustice in my world and I just, I'm helpless to do anything about it. I can't fix the problem. And we can say, you know, why is, why is my concern hidden from you, God? Why, why are you not answering? Why are you not hearing me? This is the nation of Israel in bondage having these same frustrations, the same frustrations that we may be having. How about when you're just tired of how far you've come? Um, I, I, we, we've talked, uh, you know, about this whole COVID thing. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm kind of tired of it. You know, I'm, I'm weary of having to think about everything I do, about what precautions I have to take. You know, um, is that person, is that person infected? Do I need to stay away from them? And we just have the same thing over and over, and it, it just wears us down. How about, how about political commercials? Are you tired of those yet? <laughs> <laughs> it's that same Draw. way. You know, God, why don't you rise somebody up that's, you know, can, can live rightly before you and lead rightly before you? Uh, we get weary in our world. And maybe we decide, you know, I've, I've done everything for Jesus that he's asked me to do. And I think that's enough. I think, I think, he's, I think he's done with me. I think we're okay. You know, I'm, I'm living all right. I'm going to church every week. Uh, you know, I read my Bible. I pray every night. Is that enough? And that's when it becomes dangerous thinking, when you think you've done enough. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Exactly right. And that's the whole you're point. You're not done your death. <laughs> There's no retirement in Christianity. Um, I got one for you. So we're talking about all this, and this is just 
I had a conversation with somebody one time, and I don't know if this is even pertinent to all this, but he won, he said that sometimes God allows us to become um, weary in how far we've come to make the transition easier so we don't miss what we're transitioning from. Re relief that we're yeah, relieving like, it. Right, like the, at the end of maybe a season of your life that you've really enjoyed, sometimes the ending is uh, not quite as nice as you thought it should be, but, but that's all actually God's grace allowing you to become weary in that. And moving on to something else. Like when I decided I was done having babies. <laughs> well, is that after three or four? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. That, I think that's really good. I think that's really good, Sean, because when I think about, you know, giving up a career, you know, I was, I mean, it was really a great thing. And then like in the last six months, I got so tired and so weary and we ended up moving here. Yeah. I mean, the same thing happened to me. Uh, you know, I, I it took four years of waiting for a new job. I had, but I had something I loved and I, you know, I, we just got closer and closer to the end and like I knew a change was supposed to happen. I didn't know when. And, you know, I kept being faithful and, you know, doing the giving a hundred percent like I'm supposed to, but I could feel like, I could almost feel like God was telling me, yep, this is where you become weary. And this is where I pick you up and put you somewhere else to refresh you and to start the next chapter. So I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if, if he allows that as part of his plan or ways, his way, or my way is not hidden from him, but maybe that's part of the transitional process. Yeah. It just seems hidden. Yeah. I think, I think it's also, you know, for me personally, I think it's a way of clearing my plate. Um, you know, I had, I was working in the courthouse doing a job that I loved and I decided I was getting bored with it. And then I decided that I was going to go back to school and get my master's. And I remember having a conversation with my dad and he said, no, you can't do that. You can't work full time. You can't go to school full time. You can't take care of the kids. You can't take care of your mom, your, you know, mom and I. And I said, oh yeah, I can, I can do all that. And two weeks later, my dad had a heart attack and died. Oh oh then no. six weeks later, my mom died. Oh no. And then my job, the job I love went away and they put me in a different department. And it was, I mean, so it was like eight weeks of, oh my gosh. And all my friends kept saying, what are you going to do? And I said, you know, I guess. God's clearing my plate. I'm going to go back to school because my job was taken away. My parents were taken away. You know, all I had left was my kids and the idea of going, the hope that I could go to school and become a counselor and do that. And, you know, that's not something I would have ever chosen, mm -hmm. but it definitely, it definitely opened the door. And I felt, I felt God's hand in it saying, you know, this is okay. You're going to do this. This is what I want you to do. And I always say, I laugh. I'm like, I don't want to do this kicking and screaming again. God, it don't have to be so hard. Okay. Just, <laughs> you know, nudge me gently next time. Don't do it the hard way. I don't want to do clear everybody out of my life that I love, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If, if the nudge worked, you would nudge you. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. I know, Tim. I'm not good with nudges, I guess. <laughs> So what's, what do we conclude from this? Because I, I, I think if, you, if, if you're honest with yourself, and I think we all are, we could probably identify with one of these four statements at different times in our life, different seasons in our life. And how do we get out of that? How do we, how do we go past that? And I, Isaiah tells us that the nation is that way. They're in captivity. They're frustrated. God seems to be far away. And we have this voice in the wilderness that's calling us to repent, to change our mind, to change our focus, to renew ourselves. 
they were still the chosen people. That didn't change. But there is this call to renew. And uh, let's finish up the Isaiah. We'll see, kind of see how, how, that, how that goes. Um, and uh, Donna or Vince, would you read this one, please? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding is beyond searching out. He gives power to the faint and increases the strength of the weak. But when we're that way, he's not that way. And we under, underestimate God. Because he's not, doesn't sound, he doesn't seem to be doing what we think he should do. So we underestimate him. But he's faithful, he's strong, he promises, and he's willing to be our shepherd. We read all of that in, in Isaiah. And he does that because we are tired and weary and spent and frustrated and fruitless and pointless, and abandoned, and add your own adjectives. Because we're that way, God comes back with his faithfulness, his strength, his promise, his willingness to be our shepherd. But he does ask us to do one thing. What does he ask us to do? Then him. Even the youths grow tired and weary. Yes. And young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord, those that wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength and they will mount up with wings like eagles and they will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not faint. How do we deal with those seasons in our life? How do we deal with the frustration and the weariness that we have? We seek God and we wait for him with his strength and his comfort and his shepherding and he will renew our strength. Gives us hope. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I got out of this is being weary is not unusual. Mm -hmm. It's not just me. It happens to the fresh as well as the seasoned. True. Even the youths get tired. Everybody has these seasons. This isn't, this isn't a new thing. And being complacent, which for me is a problem because I like ruts. It's too easy. But John's call reminds us to repent, act, and produce, and that requires effort. Go back to that Romans 12, 2 verse, which, which is quoted here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's an action there. We need to renew our minds. We need to renew our dedication. We need to renew um, our hope. We need to remind ourselves that God's for us. And it's in those things um, that allows us to be renewed. That's that's a really good thing to while we're waiting on the Lord, we might as you know we should be renewing our minds. Right. And then Isaiah reminds us where to find the strength to start again in our current season, whatever that is. Okay. Well, this is the conclusion slide. <laughs> um, this ought to be an easy, easy question. How's John's mission like our, like our own? Well, he's seeking to get to know God better, and he's been charged with leading people back to God and making a way for Jesus. Preparing the way for Jesus. We have the same mission? Yes. Yes. All yeah. of the above. Yeah. Um, is John's challenge continual? Yes. Yeah. For all of us. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, we, we, we think about repent as, you know, turn from the sin, and, and that's true. But remember that repent is like the renewing of the mind as well. It is this renewal process that we need to be in because we do get tired and we do get weary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to gain that strength and move forward and produce fruit. Anything you heard tonight that's going to encourage you to seek renewal? Yeah, almost there. Mute yourself for a second. 
don't know. I just, I like the whole concept of the study. And I just think that when you hear the whole thing from the beginning until you get to the verse, it, it just completely changes the depth of, of what, what the verse, I mean, the depth of growing weary, the depth and all the examples leading into it. And then it's almost just like a relief where he's saying, but trust me. And again, it's in the Bible. It's, it's true, you know, and it's kind of a, just hearing us speak it tonight, almost like a relief when we got to the, you know, the impact, the verse, it was just, it was just a relief to hear and to know and to believe it and know it's true. Um, so it's just a reminder that as you go through your day, you're going to mess up. You're going to get tired. You're going to have to ask for forgiveness. You're going to have to turn around and you're going to have to ask God where he wants you next. Yeah, the, the, I agree with you, Sean. The two words I took out of this was weariness and renewal. And, you know, I feel weary every day. <laughs> but, you know, to renew is, is the right answer. I often speak the verse about creating me a clean heart, oh God, and re renew a steadfast spirit within me. Yes. Um, that, that's a daily exercise, I think. That's yes. right. That's right. And some days it's a hard exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some days you have to kind of face who you are, and that isn't always pretty. Mm -hmm. Well, just like uh, Micah 6, 8, you know, just what's required of us to act justly, you know, <laughs> to love and to walk with our God. You know, even those three things are difficult. But not impossible. All things are possible through Christ who strengthens me, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's coming up in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, Philippians. All right, well, that's what I have for tonight. I, th this is the first attempt of doing it this way. Um, so we're going to we'll, we'll take some pluses and minuses, and we'll, we'll, we'll hit it again next week. Can I, you say you sent out the verses? I'm sorry? Did you say that you sent out the verses? For this week, and I'll send the ones out for next week. I, I, we, didn't I don't, we didn't get them. Was that a... a uh, we didn't see them. Okay, it was. It should have been attached to the link. So, no, the one you got last week. Oh, last week. Okay, I, I, that's uh, why. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I have been vindicated. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind, right? <laughs> yeah. got any final thoughts? Um, I guess. My thoughts are, you can't always listen to your feelings. Um, often you have to shut your feelings off and just go with what you know to be true and just latch on and repeatedly say the verses that give you peace and encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, there've been plenty of times I've had to do that. Yeah, that's a, it's quoted that old John MacArthur thing. That's what he says, you know, the, the, the Greeks said it's the, the heart is the, um, is the intent and the will. And it's from that that emotions come. Um, when we were first dating, uh, Cindy said something to me once that stuck with me. Goes, and, and the question basically was, why did you choose to feel that way? Why do you choose to feel that way? I didn't realize it was a choice. But in a lot of ways, it is a choice. Because of what I can focus on, what I can dwell on, what perspective I want to take in the situation. Uh, by fixing my mind, you know, my emotions follow. Okay, well, thank you all for joining. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do a quick close here because we're already uh, past time uh, in prayer. And then, uh, oh, can I can I do a um, just a quick prayer request, Tim? Um, why don't you just close this out and you can include that? Okay, that sounds good. All right. Dear God, thank you for bringing us all here together. Dear God, help us to learn what you want us to learn and guide us through this Bible study. God, thank you for Tim and all the hard work that he puts in every week on these Bible studies and these verses. Dear God, we know it's a, it's a tremendous task. 
um, lead him and give him wisdom and guidance. Dear God, thank you for everyone who has joined our Bible study, the people that were there here before and the people that are going to teach us. Um, new people always enrich us and bring us closer to learning new meanings of your word. Dear God, I'd like to lift up Harry and Chris as Chris's sister Kathy has been placed into hospice and not expected that cancer has ravaged her body. So please, God, be with the family. Give them comfort and strength that know that Kathy's time here on earth, while it was long in some ways, it was too short for her family. And dear God, give them the strength and comfort to know that you are going to welcome her into your arms and she will be free of the pain that she has been experiencing so many, at least so many years. Dear God, thank you for everyone who's contributed today. And thank you, God, and make us all be blessings and spreading your word, God's word, through um, the wisdom that you have taught us today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.